thank you. Good morning. I, I love coming to this conference, but I'm sorry that it's raining right now for you. And I bring that little tidbit up because as, in a minute I will introduce Victoria. As you will see uh, through her eyes in particular, going through the rain is a particular adventure. And uh, she captures that in one of her most recent books. But let me tell you a little bit about Victoria. I've known Victoria since 1996. We became colleagues and friends over that period of time. I was superintendent of schools uh, in a local school district and new to the district. And Victoria was engaged in a company called Synergy Solutions. She actually created that. And I was working on trying to communicate with over a thousand employees and how they could best communicate with me. Victoria came in, did a whole background check on me, worked with my staff, and established a communication network that was extraordinary. From that moment forward, we have collaborated on many similar projects, and I've gotten to know her over these years as a, an amazing person. Uh, she's a best-selling author, human resource expert, entrepreneur, and a person with a lifelong disability. As a highly sought-after speaker, she uses her own life experiences as seen through her eyes, including mobile limitations and challenges, childhood bullying experiences, and difficult social acceptance scenarios as a springboard to support others. Victoria is inspirational in guiding us to uncover our inner strengths that leads us to triumph over adversity. As a collaborative author on a recent best-selling book, Building the Ultimate Network, she contributed her business networking expertise in commanding the room. Her recent literary work, co-authored co by the way with me, is a creative nonfiction book, The Couch and the Hairball, How a Disability Turns Tragedy into Triumph. It includes hard-hitting life tragedies caused when a near-fatal accident leaves the main character, and I think you'll catch the play from Victoria, the main character, Tori, with a lifetime disability, inspired from the challenges faced by real people who discover how to summon strength and press on to live life beyond the disability. In her personal life, Victoria is known for her coffee conversations as a time when she works with others in our community and challenges us to stretch beyond our comfort zones in order to achieve a higher level of personal and professional success. Victoria and I have been collaborating on this work for the last three years and in it the heart-wrenching stories of someone with a disability and the triumphs and tragedies that occur allow us to see life through her eyes. In a moment, I will bring Victoria to the stage as you get an idea of what it's like, again, through her eyes, to come to ESU and come on upon this stage and spend some time with you.
As seen through Victoria's eyes, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Victoria Mavis. Okay, so let me start again. Hi, how are you? Good, uh, good to see you all and good to be here. And I really thank the staff and the um, professors of the Special Education Department for having me here today to tell my story. Now, if, you've, if you don't, um, haven't been through the lens of somebody with a disability, you really need to understand what life is like so that you can help. Because down the road, whether it's in your classes, whether it's with your students, you will be called upon at some point to lend a hand. And so our stories are all designed just to show you what life is like. And again, as uh, Dr. Sinisi said, it's through my eyes. So when um, you think about the journeys you're going to hear today, I w want you to think about gaining insights into how you can assist. And that's uh, helping people with disabilities have a quality of life through education, self-advocacy, and even by your leadership example, what you do in the everyday world that helps people and demonstrates um, your sensitivity. So here's my story. It was October 10th, 1965, when I woke up for the first time in several weeks. And I look at the foot of the bed that I'm at, um, and there's these people I know, and I, it's like the family I've been staying with that are about to adopt me and my sister. And as I look around, I'm like, where is Rachel? That's my older sister, because I don't see her. And I start to talk, and I can't talk because there's something like, whoops, there goes my mic. There's something in my throat, and it's a tracheotomy. And if you don't know what a trach is, they put a hole in your windpipe so that you can breathe. So I can, you know, it's helping me stay alive. And then I feel something on my head, and I go to move my hand, my right hand, and it won't even move. And then I'm looking down at my feet, and they're in a cast. And they're separated by a metal bar. I'm a little kid, and I don't know what's happening, but the last thing I remember is I was playing with Rachel, and she's not even here now. So that, you know, I start to cry, and the people that are, that the family that are about to adopt us hear me, and they, they run over, and they try to comfort me, but it's really going to be weeks until that comes, because the only thing I know to have comfort with is that Rachel's there, because when she's there, everything's okay. You know, and that's going to be a long time before you see her. And it's going to take years and sometimes decades to learn everything that took me to that day. So it started out on a sunny August day. We were, you know, Rachel's five and a half and I'm four, and we're playing on the farm, the farm of the people who are about to adopt us. In the morning, we're having, we're picking dandelions. And we, I used to think we liked picking dandelions. I think that's what the adults told us, just so we'd stay out of trouble. <laughs> so we're picking dandelions, and in the afternoon we're supposed to be with the men in the barn. And we were city kids. We were not farmers. So we go to the, with the men in the barn, and our big thing is playing in the hay. And if you're, are there any farmers in the room? One brave person, yay! You know, so if you're not a farmer, like I wasn't a farmer, maybe there's three farmers here. You know, a hayloft tends to be the second floor of the barn, and they store hay in there, they store grain for the animals. And so we were playing there while they were working. If you look at a hayloft, it looks kind of innocent, right? You know, um, we're playing tag, going by the grain sacks. The cat, the barn cats are looking at us from afar. And um, I realized that day that tragedy can really strike in an instant. It doesn't take much. And like I said, you know, looking at the hay, Sorry, i got to do a different thing here. Looking at the hay, we thought it was harmless. But on that hot August day, it only took a minute to go from a blonde hair, a, a blonde, blue-eyed girl who adored her sister to being someone who was paralyzed after having an accident where I fell from the first floor, or second floor of the hayloft to the first floor, landed headfirst on the cement floor. Now, that is tough. And I know that, and my apologies. But that's what life is like. Now, what happened, I'm laying there. You know, Rachel is doing what she's doing. And I say that because those are sometimes the stories we never want to tell. 
but you have to tell them. You know, skip forward, I was scooped up in the uh, arms of the person who was my grandfather, soon to be grandfather, rushed to the county hospital. Of course, the county hospital doesn't have the kind of technology, you know, to deal with uh, that kind of injury, so I was then transported to a city hospital that was over two hours away. And the doctors worked very quickly to save my life. They shaved my head. They had to stitch up my injury. My, I have a, my head was cracked between um, the middle of my head and my left ear. So I have a big scar. And you know, although I survived the fall, I was still in a coma. And as the weeks and months went on, you know, the doctors um, looked and they didn't have a lot of hope that I would ever be anything other than maybe in a coma or brain dead. You know, they ended up telling my, advising my pa parents of that. They cut my tendons in my right, um, my right foot to help with what they call, I think it's muscle spasticity. I can't say that word. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> they did that, and they still continued to say she's never going to be anything other than being in a coma. So despite the medical expertise I was given, my parents chose not to believe that. And instead, they continued, and this is just my parents, they continued to pray for my recovery. In fact, I asked my mom a couple years ago, when was when uh, Dr. Sinisi and I were working on the book, I said, Mom, when that was going on, what'd you think, or what happened? And she said, you know, the only thing I knew to do was pray. And she said, I just prayed that God, to God that your head would be okay. I'm like, oh, oh, it's that simple, you know? Because to her, that's all it was about. If my head was okay, I could have as normal of a uh, life as possible. That came true. You know, my head's okay. After all these years, at least I think it's okay. And, however, it did leave me with paralysis on my right side. You know, months of therapy. And that, that paralysis is long lasting. It doesn't go away just because you can't see my scar anymore. So once I came out of the coma, I had to go through rehabilitation. And it, it was everything from walking to talking. I had to learn every life skill all over again at the age of four. Um, so, and rehabilitation, services were tough to get. One, we were in the, the uh, country, you know, hours away from, um, you know, city kind of services. And two, back in the 1960s, there wasn't a lot of um, services for rehabilitation. In fact, somebody was like me that had a, disability, we tend to not, not to go out, I don't want to say go out in public, but it wasn't a public acceptance. In, in the 1960s, there were no intermediate schools, there was no IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, that ensures an equal education for people like me. Instead, people with disabilities were treated, uh, if you were physical disability, you were treated as though you had a mental or emotional disability. And in many cases, people ended up in psych wards because we didn't know what to do with them. I'm sorry, we didn't know what to do with them. Uh, and my parents, I still remember my mom saying this. They just told us uh, we should put you away. Life would be better for you. And I, you know, I'm thankful that they didn't. Instead, they chose to saw another, uh, something, as Dr. Sinisi said, beyond the disability. So, you know, I didn't realize it, but their next fight was then with the school system. Because, you know, the experts, like I said, they think I should be or institutionalized. There were no people with disabilities in the school, ever, anywhere. And so they had to fight and petition the school board for my acceptance, and they won. And what I didn't realize until decades later, that that was the beginning of the same journey I would have everywhere I go for the battle for independence, acceptance, and equality. And it's one that I unknowingly fight with every person I meet, every job I apply for, and every place I travel. And that's just, that's just my journey. So over the years, forgive me for just a second. Sorry. <laughs> You know, I need an assistant. I know, I gotta get the, gotta get the cap off. I got it. Let 
You know, it's the little things you don't think about. But that's what it is, because we don't think about things like that. I mean, I, honestly, I didn't think about it. I better have the water open. Otherwise, how am I going to do this? Holding the mic, doing my nose, and trying to get the water. So, sorry, click. Okay, so over the years, you know, here's what life has been. I've had the love-hate relationship with school. And like every other kid, I just wanted to fit in. But that so wasn't working. You know, and you guys know that. You've been through school. You have your own, you know, you, we all have our own memories of what that looks like. No one wanted to be my friend. Now, when I look at that, the most agony I suffered was at recess. I mean, that was torture. I would, as a little kid in recess, I'd find a way to, you know, hang back in the room or sneak back in. And one of my favorites was always at uh, recess, I would say I was sick. You know, I suddenly got sick. So, because if I was sick, I didn't have to go outside. So one day, one of the teachers called me on it, and she looks up at me, and she, or looks down at me, and she says, why aren't you playing jump rope with the little girls? And I look up at her, and I'm like, I got little tears running down my cheeks. I say, because they won't let me. And she looks at me, and she grabs my hand, and she says, come on. Drags me out on the, you know, on the lawn or on the resource ground, gets up to the little girls, literally almost shoves me to them and says, here she is, let her play. Now, how do you think that went? You know, really? <laughs> so, I don't know if they even still do jump rope, but in my day, the, the penalty of the jump rope was you had to hold the end of the rope forever, right? If you weren't any good, you know, that was, that was me, my new job. That was the only way I could ever play, is I had to hold the end of the rope forever. I mean, that just so doesn't work. And if you look at things like, you know, the, I, when I decide, okay, this isn't working, so I guess I won't play with the little girls and jump rope because I'd like to participate. Then I look at the equipment. None of the equipment works for me. It all requires agility, balance, skills, things I don't have, except for my friend the duck. I like the duck, right? He's, he's big. I can sit on him. You know, I can do something. I don't have to worry about the monkey bars or something like that. Well, my infatuation or my companionship with the duck didn't last very long because the teachers will come out and they swoop outside and they say, you're not supposed to be on that duck. That duck is for the little kids. Great. And then it, when, if it wasn't the teachers, it was the students who would, you know, chastise me, baby, baby, because only the babies play on the duck, right? So I couldn't even go by the duck or look at the duck without getting uh, tormented by the other, by the other uh, students. What I did see in, you know, the playground activity was that forced integration didn't work back then, and it doesn't work today. So instead of forced integration, we have to have a way that we have acceptance. So when, um, when I look at what happened beyond that, my next journey into, you know, trying to be social at school was I discovered co-ed uh, baseball. Yay. And I discovered boys along with it. It was a great year. <laughs> but here, uh, we're, so we're one day out at recess. We're out at recess, and they, we decide to have this co-ed baseball game. And there's two boy captains. And they go and they pick all the boys. And then they go to pick the girls. And I'm like the second girl that's picked. And I'm like so excited. And I think it, it's because I'm tall, right? I'm one of the taller girls. And I'm like, oh, this is great. I've been drafted. And you know, the baseball game goes along. And about, uh, I'm supposed to be last at bat. And I'm okay with that because I'm just playing. As I'm watching the game, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I, I've never even held a bat or a ball before in my life, ever. And now I'm seeing if I am lucky enough to hit the ball, how am I going to run around the bases? Because the walk you saw today is the same walk I had maybe a little different, but it's the same walk I had at four years old when I recovered. It just wasn't, you know, it wasn't going to work. And so I go to the, the captain, and I'm so scared. I'm like, oh, what do I, you know, and he says, don't worry. He says, you know, in professional baseball, they have, a, they have uh, one of those pinch runners, right? So we'll let you do that. And so he got me the best runner, you know, the best runners for me. And I think, oh, go, gosh, good. And I just want to be able to, be able to have contact with the ball.
So now it's the end of the game, nearing the end of recess. Uh, you know the story. Bases are fully loaded. I'm up. There are two outs, right? Could it not be any better? So I go up there and I'm like, oh. and the teacher kind of shows me how to hold the bat. And I go to swing and I get a strike and then a ball and then another ball and a strike. And I'm just like, oh, please, just let me have contact. And the next pitch comes, and it's a strike. And the recess bell rings. We lost the game when we could have won. And every kid reminded me of that, some way or some shape, on the way back to class. And I'm sitting there, I'm like so devastated and so humiliated that I couldn't help our team win. And as I'm walking back, to, you know, tears are coming down, and I'm thinking, there's got to be another way. There just has to be another way. And I really decided in that moment, I can be smart. Because if I can be smart, at least the teachers will accept me, right? So I became very smart from that point on. And people who know me know I've made a lifetime out of being smart. Because it's what I could do and do well. So, you know, maybe it was the best thing that ever happened. Because if it wasn't that I wouldn't have struck out, I don't know that I ever would have thought about electively being smart. Now, as we continue in the, uh, the school years, what happened on the you know, small, the um, K through five, uh, progressed into middle school, it didn't get any better. The treatment just looked a little worse. This is where the bullying occurs. I mean, Back then, we didn't call it bullying. We called it get, getting picked on. Teachers didn't know what to do. I mean, that, sorry, they didn't. They would turn their heads and pretend nothing existed or nothing was wrong, and that it was my problem and I had to deal with it. So I understand the bullying that goes on in the classrooms. It's not in the classrooms, it's at recess, it's in the corridors, it's on the bus, it's every way you, where you go, where you're reminded you're different and you don't, you're not accepted and you don't fit in. I was always the brunt of the jokes in the classroom or out of the classroom. And, you know, when we look at what that does, I, you know, when I first started talking to one of uh, Dr. Sunisi's classes, he said, tell me about your childhood stories. I'd say, do I really have to? He says, yeah, you really do. And I can tell you, they weren't pretty. I had to dig in three years of digging to come up with some good things. Because when you're, when you're bullied, that's all you remember. It takes away all the good things. And that's what stuck in my mind for all these years. But that being said, you know, I look back on my teachers, and a lot of my teachers wanted the best for me. Some of them knew how to bring it out, and some of them didn't. But they had my welfare at their, you know, most of them had my welfare at, the, at their uh, forefront. And when they believed in me and they opened the doors of education, Here's the thing I learned. It took a while. Education is a great equalizer when it comes to a person with a disability. Now, I didn't make that up. I heard that from another gentleman, Mark Smith, who uh, works for Pride Mobility. And when he said it, I'm like, that's right. It does. And that was my corridor into the world you heard about. I mean, my bio is read. I've done, I've done a lot of different things. And we don't, ex we don't necessarily attach those different things that I've done with the person with the disability, because that's our mindset. So when I look at education and what that provided, it opened up everything for me. Now, it didn't do it just with education. I had to have you know, some initiative. I had to have some things on my end to want it. But the education was a fundamental of what I built. And what I knew is that before graduating, I had to have more than just a diploma to get a job. The job market was no different when I came in than it is today. And that's uh, something I understood. And that a lot of my, you know, although I was very, like I said, I was very smart. I graduated second in our class of 125 people, 3.96 out of four. And I always say this, and I would have had, you know, top four if it wouldn't have been for what? Jim and typing. The two things I couldn't do. And you think about that. With somebody with that high of uh, academic accomplishment, because of my disability, 
some of the doors that would be easily open for other people were not accessible to me. Forget about being open, they were just weren't an option. You know, when I look at what I wanted to do at high school, I got told, no, you can't be a doctor. Who's gonna, you know, and all those things are what we can do, it goes back to that's a perception people had. Um, so that didn't get, you know, my academics didn't get in my way. There, but it was that prejudice or that uh, uh, assumption of what I could do or couldn't do. Now in high school, um, what I, I entered the internship program. We called it a co-op program in my junior year. And I don't know, it was probably my counselor that, I think she said, her words were kinda, you're, you're not gonna go to, on to a school, so you might as well find a way to get, in a, get a job. And so she pushed me out there and I got a job at the local hardware store. My job was dusting. The age of 17, I'm dusting. And three months after starting this, the job, I get fired. And I go to the guy, who, the owner, and he said, well, why was I fired? He goes, well, you couldn't dust. Really? Now, this is ironic, because that's my job at home. I know dusting very well. And I came back, and I talked to my mom and dad, and they do what they always did. They said, brush your knees up, brush your knees off, get out there, and do it again. So I did, and I, and I didn't have very long to think about, was the real issue my disability? Was the real issue maybe my attitude? Because I have an attitude that it will outpace normal workers. And when a kid at the age of 17 comes in with this energy and these good ideas, and you have employees that have, we'll say lackluster performance, it doesn't sit well. So I walked, I, got, I uh, dusted off my little niece, and I walked across the store to the, uh, across the um, road or street to a, her, uh, I'm sorry, a drug store. Now I live in a one stoplight town. Everybody knows everybody, especially the people that are in business. So I walk across to the uh, drug store guy and I'm interviewing with the owner and he sees my resume and he says, so, oh, you worked at the hardware store. I said, yep. He said, Would you, why'd you leave? I got fired. For what? because I couldn't dust. He looks at me and he smiles and he hires me on the spot. And guess what my job was? Dusting. <laughs> now you think about that, that is just so funny. But the job wasn't about dusting. The job was really about a business. It was about learning inventory control. It was about learning to rotate stock. It was about learning you know, suppliers, pricing, customer service. How do you make a profit? That's really what the job was about. But I had to dust to get access to that, those keys and to have someone trust me enough to open that kingdom for me to have experiences. Now whether it was that internship co-op, whatever you want to call it, or was my other uh, experience, my volunteer experiences, those were really vital in opening up the door. If that wasn't on my resume or my application, nobody called me. And so we have to look at building those type of skills along the way. Um, but it was also in addition to what I could do like work-wise, what I also understood was it's my initiative, it was my outlook, it was my kind of my attitude that people hired beyond, the, beyond what was stated on the resume. Now at the age of 25, I, you know, just fast forward to a couple of career stops, at the age of 25 I was a stockbroker. You know, not a bad gig for a 25 year old. And it was the first time I had to confront the fact that I had a disability. Because you see, I didn't see myself that way. I didn't, I didn't see that at all. I just saw I had this leg that didn't work as well as the other one, or didn't work like yours did. But I never saw myself as being disabled. However, that's what people saw. So, you know, I have my stockbroker job, and I have it. We're in a city that has very little public transportation, and I have to park my, I can't afford downtown parking, very expensive. So I park my car a half an hour, or I'm sorry, half a block away, not a half a block, half a mile away walk to work and back every day, lugging all my stuff. And you saw me kind of, you know, 
schlepping in today, lugging all my stuff, and right outside of our building was a handicapped parking space. And I looked at it every day and I thought, gosh, can I park a little closer? Why, can, why can't I park there? Yeah, think about it. I could have. I could have. If I would have saw myself as a person with a disability, I could have parked there every day. But I didn't. And it took me years and decades to see that I do have, I'm not disabled. But I do have a disability. But it doesn't limit me from everything. Makes walking and some other life skills a little challenging. But, you know, that's it. So fast forward to today. I, I'm at the, the ripe old age of, I'll just leave it older than most of you in the room. And, you know, I've lived a full life. I've, you know, some people would call it the American dream. I really have had a gifted life. And it's only been because of other people. But when I look at what started it, it was education. You know, I've had access to education. I've lived in and out of communities. I've had great relationships, personal and professional. I've done almost everything I've wanted to do. I went, you know, um, parasailing. Now, I don't know if I'd do it today, but I went parasailing, and there's other things I've got, done. And I've um, owned businesses, fallen in, and yes, fallen out of love, you know, like we all do. And it really started by people believing in me. Because if you believe in me, you'll give me a chance. And you'll help, and that helps me along the way. So as you can see, you and I are no different. I, you can take anyone with any disability uh, and put them up on the stage. They'll have their own story. But they're really no different in what they need, want, or desire in life. And that's what your help is all about, is in how do they access that. But if you can't get beyond my disability to see through my eyes, you're never even going to see the richness that my world can bring to you. So when I was younger, I used to uh, try to hide my leg, especially if I went out socially, right? Because you, you, I have to, you have to think about it. When you saw the video of me coming out of the car, you had a whole different thought. Once I took the stage, different thought. Once I opened my mouth, a different thought. When we sit down and have our coffee conversation, you'll have a totally different thought. And that's just how we relate to people. And that's who we are. So when we look at that, the perspectives of what we have, until we can engage somebody, we really don't know their world. Nor do we know how to bridge and get beyond whatever stands in the way. In my various jobs that I've had, I've seen people with disabilities do great things that, uh, I, you know, I always get when I say the word normal, because, you know, that's, that's just been my language forever, that people without disabilities won't even attempt doing. And yet there's people that have the slightest disability, and they don't have what it takes to push on. And people would ask me, what's the difference? Well, I, you know, in my perspective, the difference is all in your attitude. You know, you can really accomplish anything with your attitude. But what it also requires, and this took me a lifetime to learn, it sometimes takes the help of a friend or a stranger to do what it is you're up to. And that's hard for us to both bridge in and out of having that. So if you ask me if I think the world is prejudiced against people with disabilities, I'd have to say yes. However, that's not the full story. We're also prejudiced against kids with earrings, or I'm sorry, nose piercings. People who have a different color skin or eyes than we do. Or people with names that are hard to pronounce. We, we all have that. And that's just our natural prejudice. And it's OK, but we have to find a way to work around that. Because at the end of the day, if a person with a disability doesn't get a job, I've been fortunate. I've been employed my whole life. But if they don't get a job, you and I as taxpayers pay for that forever. And when I say we pay for that, once a person you know, gets on government programs, it's really hard to get them out of it. And it's more a mindset shift because they start believing, I can't do anything else. And so that's where we really have to, in my belief, focus our energies. So this has been part of my journey. And I just want to shift to what you can do to help 
Because I don't think, you know, I wouldn't be who I am if I didn't say, here's a way to bridge it into your world. And here's how you can help. Because you're not helping me. I've done my career. Now I'm probably on my third career in my lifetime. But you're helping people like me that are coming through the system. And so that's what I want you to take away. So, you know, when you look at how many people are out there like me, like I said, in 1966, I was the only one in the county. Everybody else was institutionalized. So my community that I came from, they, have, they had no understanding. Today, there's 54 million Americans with a disability, which represents 20% of the population. When we look at who's employed, uh, I'm sorry, let me back up. Well, there was a survey done that says 90% of the people surveyed um, favorably look at companies who hire people with disabilities, yet only 20% of the population is employed as compared to 60% of the general population. So why is that? Well, I, I personally believe we have a system that's broken. You know, we, have to work, we all have, have to work together to correct it. So let me tell you what, I'm, you know, what I come across. We have somebody with a disability. Let's say they enjoy um, food. You know, they enjoyed food preparation. Helping mom in the kitchen, helping whoever in the kitchen. They're like, great, let's give you skills. We'll give you salad making skills. And they're like, great, okay, I'll, I can make salads. So you train them with salad making skills. And you give them all the salad making knowledge. And then you go out to the employers only to find out no one's hiring for salad making. There just are no, uh, no openings. And instead, you have a UPS store, a chiropractor, and an internet based business, all of which would love to hire somebody with a disability but they have no people with jobs. So what would happen if, you know, how do we flip that? Well, in my world, a lot of that flip is being able to connect the employer to the individual long before you ever determine what the skills are. When I, as an employer, and I've owned several businesses, you know, as an employer, I, I can train for skills. I can't train for attitude. That is true. And so I will take somebody with you know, minimal skills, I'll train them, if they've got a good attitude, because I know I can work with that. And so if we did that, that I believe would shift, and we'd see more people with disabilities employed. Is it possible? Yeah. But it's going to take work and coordination of resources by everybody. However, I don't know how many people there are in the room. You all can make a difference. You can. And for some people, what that looks like is encouraging people with disabilities to get their education. You know, minimum, they have to have a diploma. You don't have to have a four-year. Maybe you need some additional courses. But you at least need that four-year diploma. I'm sorry, that uh, high school diploma. The second thing you can do is that when you're dealing with people with skill development, start thinking about the, what's available out in the marketplace as you begin to develop skills in people and point them towards careers. You know, not necessarily with the, here, let me be the salad maker forever. Who are the employers that you would most likely work with? And the last is for you to be an advocate for somebody with a disability. Now, somebody challenged me, and I'm not going to name names, but they tend to be in this room. They challenged me a while ago about my advocacy. And I thought, well, what do you mean by advocacy? And I had to look at my own life and realize, yeah, I've done some great things. But did I do it for others or did I do it for me? And that really made me look at the journey I'm on and say, well, how do I do that in everyday life? So I think you all were given a little parking card. So one of the ideas I came up with is, you know, we all get upset at the right, the people who park in the handicapped lots. Oh, they're passing them out now? Sorry. Um, pe people that pack, um, park in the handicapped lots. And uh, Dr. Sinisi, when we were talking about this, he said, what do you do when they uh, park you know, in a parking spot and there's no place for you to park? And I said, other than wanting to key their car, I don't know what to say, right? And so what I did is develop a card that says, oops, did you forget your parking permit or did I miss it? You know, to me, that is simple everyday advocacy. You don't have to get in someone's face. It's just a, well, do you have your permit? Put it out there. You know, those are everyday things you can do. And maybe there's other everyday things, but that just was mine. 
So be, find a way to use your voice to be an advocate. So to summarize, looking through my eyes, there's you know so many people that have kind of created who I am today. I tell this in some other um, venues. Whether you open the door, you know you you know I slip and fall and you help me up and we're strangers. Or you offer to carry my groceries. It's those little things that have helped me be where I am today. The people who have given me a chance has allowed my life to be what it is. Now there are people that I recognize didn't even see there was a disability, and they could look beyond that. There were other people that saw it, found a way to bridge it, and help work beyond it. So when you look at disabilities, sometimes the people that have them, you know, my sister said it this way. We were having a conversation. She said, you know, yours just happened to be on the outside. It's very, you know, you can't, you can't ignore it. She goes, there's a lot of people that have disabilities that you never see. Now, she wasn't talking about mental illness. She was talking about things like being selfish, being, you know, not being able to give love to others, to have those quirky, right, those quirky things we have in our behavior. You know, we all have some form of disability, and some of us are, are a lack of assertiveness. And for some of us, it's more than one. I just carry mine on the outside. And I have to face it with every person I meet and I sometimes have a conversation with that. So whatever your disability is, you can either let it stop you in life by your own limitations, or it stops you in life by somebody else's limitations. Or you can choose to go beyond it, because that's really your choice, however you address that. In the world, and by you having the choice, you now can control the world you live in. Now, the world I live in, nobody is disabled. If they can get up another day, face another challenge, another difficulty, another opportunity to overcome what's ever in their way. And many times, that's going to take the hand of a friend or a stranger to overcome the hurdle that's in front of you. You know, I, I was asked this, would you change anything in your life? It took me a long time. No, I wouldn't. I like the person I am today and the person I see in the mirror every day. And I wouldn't be who I am without every one of those things happening. So with that, I thank you for your time and hear my story.